And thanks folks for, for showing up on a, on a Wednesday evening. I am going to share my screen here. Um, and I do have a little PowerPoint. And the reason I say I, I'll introduce myself as we go a little bit. Um, through, through my story, you'll learn about who I am. But I do want to begin um, by recognizing that this is a talk that has been informed by Mi'kmaq elders. And I want to give honor to those elders. And so I say, Megidid MacDonald Legiscaliadijikdit, Megidid Mac Xeramuk, Maui Gnud Madinij, Ak Abunamadultinij, Welly Unkultinij. And so what I've said is, I want to give honor to the people who are sprung from and interconnected to this land. I want to honor the territory, the Uksidamuk. Um, an interesting word, Wuxidamuk, it means the earth in Mi'kmaq, but what it really means is sitting on the surface of a sphere. And so it shows that the Mi'kmaq people always knew that the earth was spherical. Um, and I said, let us come together and learn together. Um, let us help one another and let us have peace. And right now, um, in the territory that I live in, in the East Coast, in Mi'kma'ki, um, I'm in Nova Scotia, what we call Nova Scotia today, but is Mi'kma'ki, Mi the Mi'kmaq territory. Many of you may know that, that um, right now we don't have peace. Um, there are treaties of peace and friendship that govern this land that are enshrined in the constitution. And right now they're not being upheld and it's creating tension. And so I ask you to keep um, the Mi'kmaq people in mind as they try to enact um, their treaty rights to earn a moderate livelihood. Um, and so I give honor to the community um, where I have learned. Um, I, I am a, a non-Indigenous person. I, I grew up um, in the Maritimes. I've been in, in this territory for a long time. My ancestors um, first arrived here with the original Acadian settlers and, and have lived throughout Atlantic Canada. Um, but there are so many stories I've learned since I've been working in Mi'kmaq communities that I didn't know about the territory that I live in. And so when I think about honoring territory and acknowledging that, I always, I always think about all the stories that are here that so many of us don't know. They're embedded in the language, they're embedded in the place names. Um, no matter where we live in Canada, <laughs> um, me, or Indigenous languages inform, you know, the places we live. They're, they're embedded in these places and spaces and, and they have so much to teach us. And so for me, I really, I want to honor that and I want to um, invite you to think about the places and spaces that you live in. Um, what are those words that you don't know the origins of, but maybe could learn something from and go explore um, and learn from the land and figure out what the land has to teach you. Um, so I spent my, my career as a high school math teacher. So I taught junior high and senior high mathematics for 10 years in Wagoma First Nation. I always joke that I'm one of the few people who had to move to Cape Breton to find work. Um, but if you look at this map, these are all of the, the Indigenous communities in, in Nova Scotia, and they make up a collective known as Mi'kmaq Ginamatnui, um, which is, means Mi'kmaq education, and so they actually collaborate together, they work together um, to share resources, and they negotiate with the federal government um, for educational services together. And so I was lucky enough to actually begin teaching in Wagoma as this was all coming to be. And so um, in the past 25 years, Mi'kmaq schools have gone from probably 40% graduation rates to well over 90% graduation rates and high rates of post-secondary participation, um, high rates of student engagement. Um, we're still working on math and science. Um, but um, we do have lots of folks who are now pursuing science degrees. Um, I, I'm still waiting for my first Mi'kmaq mathematician, I'm working on a few. <laughs> um, but uh, this is the area where I live and work and do most of my research. Um, so th this is actually a picture of me and my very first group of grade sevens in, in 1995. Um, and, and I share that because I've learned so much um, along the way from, from the kids who have shaped my teaching. 
Um, I, from each and every one of them, I've learned as much as I've taught. Um, and what's really cool is I've actually had the opportunity to teach some of them again in both the BED and MED program at the university. Um, and these are just a few more pictures um, from my time in Wegoma. One of the things that I really was committed to doing was not just being a teacher who popped in, did my thing and left. I actually immersed myself in the community. I, I sang in the church choir and that's how I learned to speak the language. Um, I spent time in the community. This is a, the class of, I think that's the class of uh, 1998 or 99, 1999 actually. Um, <laughs> and uh, a couple of these folks are teachers now. Um, and um, this is my, my adopted family, the Cremos, uh, my husband and I on our wedding day, that was 13 years ago. Uh, my goddaughter, who you see in the green striped shirt, is actually in her last year for BED program um, and is going to be a teacher soon. Um, so these folks I want to give honor to because they shape my understanding and they shape my learning. And, and I wouldn't be able to share the things that I'm going to share with you tonight if it weren't for the people that I've had the incredible gift of learning from. And so nothing I share tonight comes from me, it comes from the collective of being immersed in community. Um, so as an educator, one of the things that I try to do is I think about how as mathematicians and math educators, we can respond to the truth and reconciliation calls to action and how we can decolonize education. And you know, the whole notion of settler colonialism we told stories about the people who were here. You know, as, as settlers arrived, they told stories to, to oppress some and uplift others. And those stories, even though we might not believe them anymore, are still embedded in our system. And we really need to challenge those discourses that play out in ideologies in our classroom. Um, and it re really requires us unlearning some of those things and relearning new ways. And so that's where my work often is situated. In school, you know, I used to say to my students all the time, just because the math textbooks don't have Mi'kmaq math in it, it doesn't mean that it's not there. It doesn't mean there aren't ways of knowing, being, and doing that are very mathematical within the community. And so part of what we're trying to do is to actually recognize that mathematics that's already there or the mathematical ways of reasoning that are already there. Um, you know, and I love this quote by Rochelle Gutierrez because it really emphasizes <laughs> what happens in school. This whole notion that we talk about terms like Pi and Pythagorean theorem, and we set up the idea that only the Greeks and other Europeans did mathematics. We actually know that Pythagoras studied in Africa and spent a lot of time in Africa and learned a lot of mathematics from people who lived on the African continent. Um, we know that these relationships, that right triangle relationships and, and relationships in circles were known by cultures around the world, but we teach them in school telling only one version of the story. And so my goal is to try and tell other versions of the story. And so tonight, that's what we're going to do. Um, I set this up as a talk for grades five to eight. <laughs> so this is really going to be what it looks like to do math um, from an Indigenous perspective or to do math in a way that honors Indigenous communities. So I invite you to come along with me in this process of Maui Ganuda Madimk, which means coming together to learn together. And hopefully tonight, that is what we will do is we will learn together. There are two important messages I want youth to have every day. One of them is that your ancestors and elders were mathematical thinkers, even if your school textbooks don't tell their stories, right? You can learn and celebrate their stories. You can explore and investigate their stories. And more importantly, you can bring forward their stories to grow the field of what we call mathematics. The other message is that mathematics has been used as a weapon to marginalize and oppress communities the communities that are most impacted by colonialism. But the good news is, is that mathematics can also be used 
to tell our own stories and to move to work towards <clears throat> decolonization. And so we're gonna look at activities that both honor the knowledge that's already in, been in communities and activities that help us to tell the stories of communities. Um, and this picture that you see here is actually um, a, a daisy bow, a horse, <laughs> designed for splitting wood into basket strips. And so this is something that the Mi'kmaq do. They make baskets from wood strips. And, and this is an incredibly interesting process, a very scientific and mathematical process of splitting wood. Um, and so just, just one example of the knowledge that's always been there. Um, back in 2007, myself um, and my colleague Dave Wagner and um, Noel Johnson, who's a teacher and now principal in Eskasoni First Nation, um, and several other Mi'kmaq um, teachers and, and educators, administrators, um, and elders in the community started a program called Show Me Your Math, where we actually invited kids to go out into the communities to talk to their elders about the mathematics that's already there. And um, we do have a website, it's really easy to find, it's just showmeyourmath.ca. <clears throat> and there's lots of examples of activities and resources there. Um, but I wanted to share with you a story that inspired the Show Me Your Math contest, and it will also inspire our first activity for tonight. And the story is about Diane's quill boxes. So Diane Tony was my very good friend, and when I first started my doctoral work and my supervisor Dave had some money to go talk to elders, and one of the first people I wanted to talk to was Diane, because Diane used to come into the school and she shared a lot of knowledge and um, she was really quite inspiring and, and, and I, I adored her greatly. And so one of my very first research conversations was with Diane. And Diane made this porcupine quill box. So a porcupine quill box is made um, from birch bark and porcupine quills. Um, and the Mi'kmaq were known for their quill work because they only used the white quills and they only used the white part of the quills, whereas other people you might see sometimes the brown part of the quills. Um, and uh, you see Diane used a little bit of the brown in this one just as a highlighting, um, but Mi'kmaq, traditional Mi'kmaq basket was always made with the white part of the quills and quills were dyed using plants to um, make designs as you see here. And Diane talked about how she always wanted to start her pattern in the center of the circle. And when I asked her how she would find the center of the circle, she said, well, I just fold it in half and fold it in half again. And I was like, oh yeah, intersecting diameters. Um, they meet in the center of the circle. <laughs> and um, she also said to me, you know, Lisa, when I need to make the strip to go across around my circular top, I just measure three times across and I add a thumb width and it makes a perfect ring every time. So this is our first task. I want you to draw a circle. I'm gonna actually show you a little video here. This is what you're gonna do. I think you're gonna do it. Oh. Okay, wait. <laughs> when you're online, the embedded video doesn't work. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, find the video <laughs> and um, let's see if it'll play now. There we go. Okay, so we're gonna start by drawing a circle. I don't have a compass at home, so I found a candle that I'm gonna trace. Um, anything that you have that's circular, coffee cups, dishes, bowls, you could try different sizes and trace your circle, all you need is a circle. So there's my circle. Now I'm gonna take my string and I'm gonna try and find the widest part of the circle. Kind of can eyeball that in, but you can pretty much tell where it's the widest part. So it looks to be about there. So I'm gonna measure, that's once across. Pick this up, move it over. There's two times across. Pick this up, move it over. There's three times across. Now I need to add a thumb width. I'm just put my thumb right there. I'm gonna hold this so I know where to cut it. I'm gonna cut it right about here. Okay. 
and now I have my piece of string and I'm going to see if it wraps perfectly around my circle. I should have maybe enough to go around the outside edge and maybe a little bit of overlap. And you can see if that were a wooden basket strip that would fit pretty nicely on that circle. So it wraps all the way around with just a little bit of overlap at the end. Okay, so my question to you is to actually try this yourself. Draw a circle, go three times across and add a thumb width and see if it wraps perfectly around your circle. It can be any size. And what I'd like you to do after you do that is measure your circle, measure the distance across, measure your string or the distance around, and I want you to put them into this spreadsheet. So I'm gonna actually paste this link into the chat box. Oops, let me go back here. Put this. I'm gonna grab that link, paste it into the chat box. Maybe. There we go. So you can just click on the link in the chat box and you should be able to add your data in here. So we're gonna look at the distance, how far across. I did a couple myself already today. How far around or how long is your string? How wide is your circle? You can add those. I've already got the calculation in here. So when you put your numbers in, it will divide the distance around the circle by the distance across the circle. So if you see uh, somebody has a cell highlighted, go to another one because you might be trying to type in the same cell. Give folks a few more minutes to, a few more seconds, I guess, to put some numbers in there. So as we look at this, we'll see that most of us are getting three and a little bit more as the ratio of the distance around the circle to the distance across the circle. It means it's a little bit more than three times around or three times across to go around the circle. And that was Diane's rule, three and a thumb width. So three and a little bit more. And we can see that 3.3, 3.2, I'm not sure what 2.89 did, but, <laughs> but we see that relationship. And so this brings us back to some questions. So I'm just gonna come back here. I can't, I couldn't get my numbers in there. Oh no? At my cursor, I put it on there, but it wouldn't work. <laughs> okay. No, it's okay. I wrote it down. We've got quite a few pieces in there anyway, so it really just gives us a sense of kind of what it looks like. Um, and so 
what we're trying to figure out is this relationship, the distance around a circle compared to the distance across a circle, that's a relationship. Um, and we can see by the circles that we drew that we're all getting three and a little bit, oops, that's the old one. <laughs> we're all getting, getting three and a little bit more. Um, and so we want to, um, we want to explore that. So in my class, when I'm talking about this activity, I will then invite students to think about, well, if you had a circle that had a diam diameter or a distance across of 15 centimeters, how big might you need of a basket strip to go all the way around? And how could we figure that out? Does anyone want to guess? So the whole idea here is that we want to actually think about the ratio. So if we had Whether something 45, 45, a little bit more than 45, right? Yeah. <laughs> so a little bit more than 45. So we would have three and a little bit more, three times and a little bit more. And so we want to understand that that relationship is always true in circles. But is it always true? Like what happens if the circle gets really big? What would happen? Would it still be three and a thumb width? No, it would be three and more because the proportion of the decimal piece is going to be larger exactly. when the diameter gets larger. So you'd need a big thumb, as somebody <laughs> just wrote in the chat box. But we might also have a look at what Elder Ernest has to say. And uh, you measure it to make your top uh, an 18 inch hoop. And the, the method is that the circumference is equal to pi r or pi r squared, pi r d. Uh, for me, it's a little different. You know, what we use, what we did was we took a piece of, this is a, this is a hoop we're going to make. So, what we did was we took a, a piece of wood, we taper it. There's another one here, but we taper it. We tapered it like so that it's called a scarf joint. And to get the proper piece of wood, you get a scarf joint six, six inches. So you just take a one, two, three. And a, and, a, and a little more, that'll give you at least Samuel. Oh, God. I haven't seen Samuel in a long time. So you see Elder Albert or Elder Actually, Ernest do, do said. I remember there was a show on TV called Romper Room. Do you ever remember that? And a little bit oh, more. Referring to that. so I see you shook their head oh. yes when they saw it when, they, when I came And with, I think somebody's got their mic over here. Into the show. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so he was three and a hand width. And so it's that proportionality, right? That as it gets really big, what we need is our little bit more is actually going to be proportional to the size of, of the diameter. And so there's that proportional thinking. So this relationship, I've already seen some people say it's very close to pi. And, and to me, th this is a pi relationship. It is the relationship between the circumference and the diameter of a circle. And, and often we teach pi in a way that it's a number, it's a, a value that you need to use in a formula, but pi is actually a relationship. So it's a relationship between the distance around a circle and the distance across a circle. And it tells us that relationship. And as circles get bigger, you know, that relationship stays the same because it's always three and a little bit more proportional to the diameter. And so this ratio is very important. In fact, it's so important the Greeks gave it a name. They gave it pi. But the Mi'kmaq knew about it long before they knew there was a Greece. And so 
when we teach Pi in school, we need to recognize that cultures all around the world have actually known this circle relationship and used it. Diane was really, it, for her, it was really important to use it in a way that she knew exactly how much she needed to have just a little bit of overlap on her quill boxes, but not so much that she would have to cut some off and waste valuable resources. And that's really important. The notion of enough, dibyach, enigma, is a really important concept. So for her, this relationship is rooted in something very practical of having exactly the right amount to go around the circle without any waste. And so that was a really important part of, um, of knowing this relationship. And so when we're doing typical math problems, ratios come up all the time. And so we want to know about ratios. We want to know about how a ratio is a relationship between two quantities. And so when students are working with relationships, like in these math contests, we want them to actually be able to understand ratios. So exploring ratios like pi is a really important way um, to learn about rates and ratios and to be able to become comfortable in using them. We're going we're gonna to do another activity now. We're going to talk about birch bark biting. So this is something that, again, was a show me your math project. Um, and as was the drum making, that video was taken during a show me your math fair when you saw Ernest teaching the kids about making the drum ring. Um, and so as I was talking with an elder one time um, about show me your math and some of the things that we could do, um, she started to tell me about birch bark biting and she did what she typically does. She told me to go find out more about it and do some research because that's my job. <laughs> and I found an article called I'm the last one who can do this. And it was about women, Indigenous women across the country who were known to be birch bark biters. And it was written by some anthropologists who had traveled the country and, and met these women and um, talked to them about birch bark biting. And and almost all of them said, well, I'm, I'm one of the last ones who can do this in my community. And I got to the second page of the article and there was the name of Margaret Johnson of Eskasoni. Um, Margaret um, was someone we affectionately called Dr. Granny in Megamagi. Um, she was given an honorary doctorate by Sinovax in the early 90s or late 90s for her contributions to language and culture. And from that moment on, she was Dr. Granny. Um, and she was a very well-known basket maker. And it said that in the article um, that her sister from another community was also known to be a basket maker. And I knew right away that that was Caroline, Caroline Gould, who had lived in the community of Wigoma, where I lived, who was somebody I had um, great respect for. She, she was such a kind woman and she, she loved that I learned the language. And she used to say to people, if we can teach Miss Lunny to speak our language, we can teach the kids to speak our language. I was her prop at conferences. Um, and unfortunately, they had both passed on by this point in time. And, and um, went to Caroline only a, a few months before I found the article. So we really wanted to try and revive this idea of birch bark biting that was nearly lost in the community of Wegoma and in Migamagi, really. Um, so we did what we wanted, what you do when you want to learn about birch bark biting, you go online and you look it up on Google. And I was lucky enough to find some good videos. And there's a woman, I'm not going to show the videos for time, but um, there's a woman named Pat Bruderer, um, who I believe is from Winnipeg. And um, she is a birch bark biter. And so there's a number of videos. And I actually got to meet Pat at a conference a couple of years ago. And I was telling her how good it is for math to do birch bark biting. And she was very excited to hear that. So, um, but we started doing birch bark biting with the kids in the school. So we, we, you know, a couple of the elders had told me what they remembered from it. And then we just started experimenting um, to learn more about it. And these are some of the designs um, that the students did um, as we were learning 
birch bark biting. And so you can see they're quite beautiful designs um, and they're quite intricate. Now I have seen mathematicians take birch bark bitings and apply Western mathematics to them. Um, we're gonna do it a little different tonight. Um, for me, the mathematics really happens in the creating. It's, I, I, I joke that it's like right here in my head um, that I can see it in my mind's eye, but it's really about the visualizing that's important. And what I would like you to do, I'm going to give you a link to this Jamboard And again, I'm gonna paste it in the chat box. And you can, um, you can go and choose one of the pages. So there's different pages here. It actually says there's seven, but there's six. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to think about where was it folded and what did they bite? And, and feel free to draw on these. You can use tools. There's, there's drawing tools over here. Right? You can draw, um, you can point at things, you can add little sticky notes if you like, um, you can erase if you make a mistake. So I invite you to choose one of these drawings and see if you can answer the question, where was it folded um, and what did they bite? Just take some time, see if you can, I'm gonna give you a few minutes to explore. Don't be shy, jump into one that nobody's drawing on if you want to start a new one. So I'm just going to invite anyone who might like to take the mic and share, tell me what page to go to and, and what you noticed. Um, I'd like to have a few people share their noticings. What did you notice? Feel free to grab the mic. Don't be shy. Don't make me call people out. I put this in the chat, but to me, it looks like lines of symmetry. Okay. Lines of symmetry. That's an interesting noun that we use in mathematics. And I'm a big believer that we should use lots of verbs to get to those nouns. And so when I talk about where is it folded, what we're actually thinking about is how are those lines of symmetry created, right? And so for a big thing for me is to focus on, on how we when we think about where things are folded, what we actually create are, are fixed objects that become lines of symmetry. 
So there's a nice connection there between where it was folded and what are the lines of symmetry. Anything else anyone noticed? So it's always folded through the center. It's all, well, it's always folded through the center for these designs that we've created. It's sort of um, a starting point. I often think of it as like making snowflakes with your teeth. If you've ever cut snowflakes out of paper, right? Um, but I think that you could probably get more creative with different kinds of folds. Um, we aren't that good. So <laughs> mostly we folded through the center. And what's really interesting is that you actually can then start to think about how many times are you folding through the center and what, how many sections you create, right? So when we fold it in half, we create two sections. So one fold creates two sections, two folds creates four sections and so on. Um, and so that's an interesting mathematical connection that happens. I was actually thinking that it had additional lines along the edges that might make this into uh, like a, um, I was thinking at first a, a hexagon, but I, on the edges to fold them down. I was trying to figure how they got those bite marks. Uh, <laughs> Dainty teeth is the uh, answer to that question. Um, uh, these were done... Um, by Kimberly, who was a grade seven student at the time. I think she's now in her second year of college or something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, these designs were done by Kimberly. Um, some of them were, this one in particular that you see on the screen now. Um, and her work is phenomenal. Like that, we started by letting them practice on um, wax paper or patty paper and the first one that she did looked like lace. And she came up to me and she said, kind of like this. And she unfolded and I was like, <laughs> right? She just, she had this sense of it right away. It was, um, uh, yeah. Yeah. It was in her mind. Yeah. And, and, and the funny thing is, is they kind of, at first, it wasn't necessarily in her mind what she was creating. It was sort of like playing around. And I'll tell you, Phoenix, who, um, did this one actually worked really hard at perfecting the eight point star. And, and so it took him a while to figure out how to make that work. And he came into his teacher one day and he said, miss, I finally figured out how to make the eight point star. And then he was able to make it over and over again. But I knew what he meant because I had tried to make an eight point star and ended up making like weird octagons and stuff. So it was, but you really have to think about both angle and shape, right? And I mean, if you're going to bite a circle, if we take a look at this one and you need to bite a circle, you need to really understand that that's the locus of points that's equally distant from the center, right? So you really need to understand shape. You don't need to have that phrase, <laughs> but you really need to understand shape in order to be able to do that. And so when we look at this, if we look at the core of his pattern, which is basically what did he bite? Um, he's got some pretty basic shapes here that then when, you know, and you can see he does this kind of feathering technique, um, mm -hmm. but when it's unfolded, it creates this beautiful design. So what you bite is actually quite simple in the sense of biting curves and lines and little pieces, um, but in thinking about what it will look like when you unfold it, you actually get this beautiful design. And that's why we say it's so important not just to take an artifact like this and start talking about Western mathematics on it, but really in focusing on where do we fold it and what did we bite, it focuses our attention on the process of creating. And when we focus on the process of creating, we're thinking about how mathematics happens, right? And how, how that design process um, comes to be. And so for me, this is a, a really, the, the math, as I say, happens in the doing. Um, and so much of it is this visualization that happens in your head. I once said that to a psych colleague of mine, and she said, you know, I have a machine. We could see if it really is right there in your head. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, any other wonderings or noticings from, from this uh, 
playing with birch bark biting. Well, I have birch bark and I'm trying to figure out how can you fold? How, how can you, you fold? You have to peel it and you have to get it down to a single layer. Which makes it uh, delicate. Yes, it is very, very delicate. Um, I was gonna say, I think I have a piece around here somewhere, but I don't know where it would be. I should have had some. Um, but yeah, you have to peel it down to a single layer. And so there's only certain times of the year that you can actually collect bark. Um, typically it would be when the sap is running um, in, and then because birch trees like maple trees also produce sap. And um, usually they say right after the fireflies come out. And so that's a good time to collect bark. And there's different times you collect bark for different purposes. And for birch bark biting, often it's taken from a very small tree because you do want it to be thin bark. And, and if you harvest the thin bark, um, what I've been told is that you get second growth bark, which is the thick bark that you use to make a birch bark canoe. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's there's so much richness in the mathematics of it all. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. And for me, like this is really interesting because it relates a lot to some of the things we often ask students to do. So you might have problems like this where you, you know, this is just a typical problem I found on an Enrich. But again, it's that idea of thinking about how was this created helps us to then solve this problem. Right? So if we start to think about where the lines of symmetry are or where this could be folded to create that pattern and design, again, we are, that's giving us a strategy for solving this problem. Or another one that I found on Enrich yesterday, of course, um, you know, <laughs> equilateral triangles. And if we think about, again, how would this be created, that gives a, us, again, a strategy for solving the problem. Or if we think about how things can move um, through transformational geometry, again, that gives us a strategy for solving the problem. And so, so this kind of thinking that's embedded in creating design um, in birch bark biting appears in many mathematical problems where we have to think about design or shape and space or symmetry or patterns. Uh, and so a lot of that transformational symmetry um, really helps. Um, I saw someone ask the question, the folding doesn't make marks. No, it doesn't. It's really the biting that makes the marks. And actually when you're done with the biting, you can kind of get rid of the folds by wetting them a little bit so that they disappear. Um, so those are a couple of examples of knowledge that's there in the community. Um, I think we're gonna run out of time before I can go through this, but, but I'll just talk about a couple of other ways we use mathematics. I have a program called Connecting Math to Our Lives and Communities, where we do work with students about how math is a tool that can help us to solve problems in the world. And so um, one of the things that we've explored is drinking water. And this is one of the communities we work in. This was their tap water. And we know that lack of clean drinking water in First Nations communities is a huge problem in our country. Um, this is old data from a CBC article, but I highly recommend you um, look up some of this information. You can see high rates, this is boil water order advisories, over 200 a day. Um, and, uh, you know, we have, we, we can go online and find out First Nations communities that have, don't have clean drinking water. So, we often use this as a way to think about how we can tell the story. Um, and so one of the activities that I'll often do with kids is to invite them to think about how much water they use. And this is a chart from the city of Halifax um, based on occupants in your household, how many cubic meters of water you use um, in three months. So then again, we have to use that proportional thinking to figure out how much we use for a year. And then um, we can actually start to think about how many liters that would be because this is done in cubic meters. And so often when I'm doing with students in a real classroom, I will get them to build a cubic meter so that we can see how big a cubic meter is. Of course, that works out to a thousand liters. Um, and then we start to think about things like, you know, if we're all living in a community, how much water do we all need? And and then if there's a thousand people living in the community, how much water do we need? Um, and 
actually using the cubic meter and the little cubes from the base 10 blocks then becomes one part per million. So we can actually model what a part per million looks like because it's one millionth of the cubic meter. And then we can talk about what a half a part per million. Um, and so chlorine, for example, has to be less than 0.5 parts per million in water. So if it's more than that, then the water is not drinkable. And so we can talk about um, those kinds of things. Um, we often will talk about things like the cost of providing bottled water and both the environmental cost and the actual like money cost of buying all that water, but then the environmental cost of having to get that many plastic bottles and transport that much water to a community and all of that kind of stuff. And so for me, when I talk about the power of mathematics to tell stories, um, this is the kind of story I want students to be able to tell, to use mathematics in powerful ways to tell the stories about their communities. And, and I talked about the moderate livelihood at the beginning and last night in, in Nova Scotia, um, non-Indigenous fishermen burned vans and vandalized a lobster pound and threw rocks at a couple of Mi'kmaq guys trying to earn a livelihood um, through a treaty right that has been upheld by the highest courts in this land. Um, and in 21 years, that, that livelihood still hasn't been honored. Um, and so one of the students that I know who's a student here at St. Evex actually put together these, um, these data points. And, and to me, this is again, the power of using mathematics to tell stories of community. Um, so a shout out to Justice Grubin and Laura Thompson, who's a PhD student who helped him take his data and turn it into graphics. Um, these were around on Twitter, you may have seen them, but if each one of these little lobsters is a hundred traps, these two and a half lobsters represent the traps for the moderate livelihood. Two and a half traps for the moderate livelihood. So it's a total of 250 traps by this community. Um, this is the non-Indigenous fishery in that area, just in that region, 390,000 traps approximately, could be more actually. Um, you know, Mi'kmaq fishermen are trying to make 30 to $50,000 a year. An average commercial fisherman in this area makes between 250 and $500,000 a year. And, and the argument is being made that, that it's a question of conservation, but thousands of pounds of lobsters were killed last night by non-Indigenous fishermen who didn't want those men making a moderate livelihood. And so for me, again, this is the power of mathematics when we can use mathematics in powerful ways to tell the stories of community. So I'm just gonna end it there. So that's my two messages is that mathematics has always been there in indigenous communities and in communities all around the world. Um, and that mathematics can be used in powerful ways to tell the stories of communities who have been most impacted by colonization. And now we'll have a little bit of time for questions if anyone wants to ask any. I'm gonna stop.